Amen. Well, I do want to ask you to uh, join me as we uh, continue our series, Walking in Wisdom. Now, uh, today was going to be our final day, but I had to make a choice. I could have either made this message really long, or I could have divided it in two. Um, so I was always taught, as a matter of fact, uh, somebody taught me, uh, it's better to kill the sermon than to kill the people. So um, I've chosen to uh, cut this one in half and uh, not kill you. So today we're going to continue our series, Walking in Wisdom. And the title of today's message is The Blessed Partnership. Our text is Mark 16, 19 to 20. And today, if we are going to walk in wisdom, and we have to walk according to the light of God's word. So let's say our verse together. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Now, you recall that last week Jesus was giving the Great Commission. And the Great Commission really is quite simple. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the good news of all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, and whoever doesn't believe will be condemned. Now, that's a pretty simple message, isn't it? If you believe, you'll be saved. If you don't believe, you'll be condemned. Can't get much more simpler than that. And yet, you know, we as human beings have an ability to take something very simple and make it complicated. Is that true? Well, it's true whether you agree with it or not. Now, take, for example, using a cell phone. Now, you all know that I probably have the most technology experience of anybody in our church. And I think I'm resenting your laughter right now. But in any event, uh, I used to be able to use a cell phone. It was very simple. You flip it and you die. And then my battery was ready to explode, and so I had to get a new one. So I got this. That's a nice phone. I like it. It's a little complicated. This past Monday, it said, update needed. I didn't think that could be hard, so I pushed it. In 15 seconds, I had the ability to take that phone, and it began to flash words in different languages. I have no idea how that happened, but I made it happen. Another 15 seconds later, my phone was actually talking to me in a foreign language. Many different languages were coming up. It was getting really calm. All I wanted to do was make a phone call. I couldn't. So it said, after I pushed incessantly, enter your password. To my password. My password is in my phone. I couldn't get in my phone. So it says, do you know your, I don't know my password. So it's asked me two questions. Question number one. What was your first pet's name? How would I know my first pet's name? I'm 61. I was five at that point. I have no idea. Sarah set it up. She wasn't even there. The second one was, what is your childhood nickname? Well, I thought, you know, my name is Bill. It was probably Billy or Willie. So I had to put one of those in there. It came up on the screen. One of your questions and answers is wrong. It didn't tell me which one. It just said one of them was wrong. So then it asked me my email address. I've never emailed my phone. I don't have an email set up on it. I don't have voicemail on there. So I didn't know my email address. Normally I can hand it to Sarah or Emily and they can fix it. Gratefully, by that time Susie had come into the room and I could hand it to her. A few minutes later I was able to make a phone call. Very simple yet very complicated. We in the church have the ability of taking that which is simple and complicating it. Jesus said, Go, if you believe, you'll be saved. If you don't believe, you'll be condemned. It's not hard, 
Not complicated, it's very simple. The Bible says all of us are sinners, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Bible says as many as received him, to them he gives the authority to become a child of God. The Bible says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man opens the door, I'll come in. After becoming a Christian, God gives us a spiritual gift, and we're to go out, and we're to serve the Lord in the body of Christ in our area of giftedness. So it's really not hard at all. Now, when we began the Gospel of Mark, we began and we called this the Gospel of the Second Chance. And we called it the Gospel of the Second Chance because John Mark, the human author, had gone with Paul and Barnabas on a missionary journey. And then he decided he didn't want to do that anymore. And he left. But you know, he was forgiven. When we look at John Mark in the Bible, he became very important to the Apostle Paul. He was the human author of our second gospel. And so it might be that you have failed God along the way. God's called you to do something and you didn't do it. I want you to know that God is a God of a second chance. And today could be your day. You just come to him and say, God, I'm so sorry. I'm asking you to forgive me. And let God use you again. For his kingdom. At Mark chapter 9, verse 30, we changed the title of our series to Walking in Wisdom. Because Jesus in Mark chapter 9, verse 30, begins his initial walk into Jerusalem to go to Calvary to die on the cross for our sins. Jesus, as you know, was entering into a very hostile climate. And you and I live in a hostile climate towards Christianity. So what we need is to walk in wisdom. Finally today, I wanted to say thank you to you. Because you have sat with me, and you have studied the Gospel of Mark, line upon line, verse upon verse. So I just wanted to say thank you for studying the Gospel of Mark with me. Now, our text today begins in Mark chapter 16, verse 19. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven, and he sat at the right hand of God. So if you and I were just reading the Gospel of Mark, we would assume that Jesus gave the Great Commission there in Galilee, and then boom, he was taken up into heaven. But that's not how it happened. The Bible tells us that he was taken up, yes. And for all of you who are English teachers, it's in the passive voice. And the passive voice simply means that Jesus didn't just ascend, but God reached down and took him. And that's going to be very important for you and for me to remember. That God is the one who took Jesus to heaven. Now, if you want to know more about Jesus going to heaven, let's take our Bibles and let's turn over to Acts chapter 1. And let's read verses 3 through 9 and let's see how this all transpired. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days. So it's 40 days after the resurrection that Jesus ascends to heaven. A period of 40 days, and he spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them the command, Do not leave Jerusalem. But wait for the gift of my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. After this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid them from their sight. So the Bible tells us, after the Lord has spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven. And then it says, and he sat down at the right hand of God. 
He sat down at the right hand of God. So I would like to ask you to take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 22. And in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 22, here's what the Bible says. Who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. So when Jesus went to heaven, the Bible says he was taken to heaven. God the Father took him, passive voice. But then the Bible says he sat down. Jesus was taken to heaven, and then he actively, he sat down. The indicative mode is the mode of fact. So he went to heaven, and now he sat down at the right hand of God the Father. And according to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 22, the right hand of God is the place of authority and power. It is the place where everybody under his authority should submit. You remember the Great Commission? The Bible says that Jesus said, All authority is given to me in heaven and in earth. So here is Jesus. He's at the right hand of God. And he now has all authority. What's wonderful about this passage of scripture is that it's something that was promised or prophesied in the days of King David. If you took your Bibles and you went to Psalms 110, you would find the most quoted psalm in the entire New Testament. And Psalms 110 verse 1 is the most quoted verse in the New Testament. Here's what Psalms 110 says. King David, the author, the Lord, Jehovah, says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So the disciples of Jesus knew that Jesus was ascending to heaven. And because of biblical prophecy, because of biblical prophecy, what King David said under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they knew that God in heaven would say to Jesus, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Now, there's two important things for you and for me to see here. Three, actually. Number one is that Jesus is at God's right hand. Number two is that obviously the Bible is teaching that God has enemies. Until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So mark it down, God has enemies. And if God has enemies, then you and I, God's people, have enemies, correct? Correct? Yes, yes, yes. Now, now mark that down. We think everybody's going to live in harmony together. That is not the case. God has enemies, and if God has enemies, then God's people have enemies. Now, if you go down a little bit further in Psalms 110, the Bible says in verse 3, your troops will be willing. So what God says to Jesus is this, I want you to sit at my right hand. I want you to sit at the place of honor. I want you to sit at the place of authority. I want you to sit there until I make your enemies your footstool. So God has enemies. We have enemies as God's people. But he says, your troops, your troops, in verse 3, will be willing. So God says to Jesus, those who claim to be your people, those who claim you as Lord, will be willing servants of yours. So that's very important for us, because what is the Great Commission? As you are going, as you are going, proclaim the gospel, right? So you and I, we God's people, now know that we have enemies, but we should be willing to go and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, not only did the disciples know that Jesus was at God's right hand because of prophecy, but they had a confirmation. If you were to take your Bibles and you went over to Acts chapter 7, verse 6, you remember when Stephen was being stoned to death, the Bible says Stephen looked up into heaven. And he said, look, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. So the disciples 
knew that Jesus was at the right hand of God. They knew it from prophecy, but they also knew it because Stephen confirmed it. He saw Jesus at the right hand of God. Now, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 and 12 will come up on your monitor. And here's what it says. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, Jesus, had offered for all times one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. Now think with me for a moment. When Jesus was on earth, how was he received? Not well, right? He was mocked. They spit on him. They beat him. They crucified him. Think of how Jesus is referred to when you go out to a family reunion. You're talking about Jesus at the lunchroom. Or you're maybe speaking about Jesus and you're, oh my gosh, we don't want to hear about that. Jesus was cruelly, cruelly treated here on earth. But God the Father didn't treat him cruelly. How did God the Father treat him? God the Father said, Son, come up to heaven. In humanity, we push Jesus out of our schools. We push him out of our public square. We push him out of our lives. We spit on him, we mock him, we crucify him. God the Father didn't. God the Father said, Son, come. And he brought him to heaven, and he sat him at the right hand, the position of honor, the position of authority, the position where all men are to submit to him, whether angels or human beings. Now, I would submit to you that it doesn't matter whether you and I declare Jesus as Lord or not. Because God has. God the Father has declared that Jesus is Lord. And so we should do that. But even if we don't, God has already declared that Jesus is Lord. Now, if you were to take your Bibles, and you have two hands and I don't, if you were to take your Bibles and go back to our text, here's what you would read. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven, and he sat at the right hand of God. Then the disciples went out and preached. Now, what was the Great Commission? The Great Commission was, go into all the world and preach or declare the good news. I want you to know that Sammy Mason went out and declared the good news. He did that. He did that in obedience to God's word. And the Bible says, for you and for me, then the disciples went out, and they preached everywhere. Now, I'd like to stop for a moment, and I'd just like to tell you that this word preached isn't the gift of a preacher. It's not the gift of teaching. It's not the gift of exhortation. It's not the gift of an evangelist. It's just simply the Greek verb to herald, to proclaim. It's something that all of us are to do. All of us are to be proclaimers. It has nothing to do with the gift of being a pastor or a teacher. It is just something that we are all to do. So he says, then the disciples went out. They went out in obedience. Do you remember when we read in Acts chapter 1 that Jesus gave them a command? Do you remember what the command was? The command was sit here and wait. We see it too in Luke chapter 24 verse 49. I am going to send you what my father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. So Jesus said to the disciples, look. I want you to wait here, wait here in Jerusalem, until you be clothed with power from on high. So the disciples were obedient. They were obedient, and first of all, they waited, and then secondly, they went. Then the disciples went out, and they preached, they proclaimed, 
they heralded everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word with signs that accompanied them. So the Bible says that God gave them assistance. It says he worked with them. Now we're going to look at that more next week. But what I do want you to see is that God confirmed his signs. Do you see that? He worked with them and he confirmed his word. Now, if you were to look at that word confirmed in the Greek language, you would find that it's a verb and it means the sole of your foot. Right there. Babeo, the sole of your foot is the verb. The noun means basis. So I am standing here today, and I am established, I'm established right here, because this is where the sole of my feet are. God says, I am going to work with them and confirm, confirm, I'm going to establish the sole of my feet, I'm going to establish my word as they go. And so we talked about that last week. We talked about those confirming signs, the speaking in a new language, the picking up of snakes, the drinking of poison. We talked about him, the, the disciples, being able to go out and lay hands on people and uh, heal them. So we talked about those confirming signs like casting demons out. And he said, look, I want you to go. I want you to go. And they went. And they went proclaiming, they went heralding. And as they went proclaiming and heralding, they went with these confirming signs, establishing that this is God's word to men. Now, if you were to take your Bibles and go to Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, here's what you would read. How shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? This salvation, this salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, we talked about that last week, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. Confirmed by Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the others. God also testified to it by signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. So God said to these disciples, go, go, go. And I will confirm my word with these supernatural signs. And he did that. And so if you took your Bibles today, and you went to the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, here's what you would read. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. So what God did, he built this church and all churches on the apostles, the New Testament, the prophets, the Old Testament. He built on that foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ found in the Old Testament and the New Testament. He confirmed it with signs. Now he doesn't have to confirm it anymore, does he? We don't need those supernatural signs anymore. Why don't we? Because we've got the Bible. We've got God's Bible. So we no longer need the gift of casting out demons and the gift of drinking poison and the gift of uh, being able to uh, uh, speak in languages. We don't need that because we've got the Bible. So God has confirmed it. Now, how do you and I connect with this passage of Scripture? I want to make a couple connection points for you this morning, and the first is this. I want to ask you if you find Jesus in a position of authority in your life. If you were to connect today, would you say that Jesus is in a position of authority in your life? How would you describe Jesus today? To you, is he the baby in the manger? Pretty little Jesus? Is that who he is? To you, is Jesus the Christ on the cross? Is that who Jesus is? Or is Jesus to you the Son of God sitting in the position of honor and authority? The King who God has said, even though the world despised you, Son, I will honor you. You sit here in this position of honor and authority until I make your enemies your footstool. Where is Jesus in your life today? 
You know, as I thought about this, I thought about Jesus as the King directing my life, directing your life, directing our church. Is that how you see Jesus today? Or do you still see him as the baby in the manger? The Christ on the cross? Or is he the king in the position of honor and authority directing your life? And then as a Christian, let me ask you, do you see your honored position? God works with them. What a privilege. Listen, there are certain people I would like to work with. I would, there, there are many pastors of old times that I would have loved to work with. But you know, my greatest position of privilege is what? I get to work with Jesus. We are workers together with Him. And that's what I wanted you to hear today. And then I would ask you, are you sharing? Are you sharing? Because the Bible says the disciples went out and preached. It's not the gift of being a preacher. It's not the gift of evangelism. It's not the gift of exhortation. It's not the gift of teaching. It's just going out and heralding the good message. Do you remember that I told you that Sammy Mason went out and he shared the good news? You probably don't know Sammy Mason. Sammy Mason isn't a preacher. He's a pilot. And Sammy Mason got a phone call one day from a guy by the name of Steve McQueen. Maybe you've heard of him. And Steve McQueen said, you know, I just bought an antique airplane. And I need somebody to teach me how to fly it. Can you teach me? So Sammy Mason said, sure. And so Sammy Mason began a relationship with an actor by the name of Steve McQueen. A man with a terrible reputation. Adultery, alcohol, drug addiction. And Sammy Mason began day after day after day after day after day, opening his mouth and sharing with Steve McQueen that he was a sinner, he needed a Savior, and Jesus was the only Savior. Day after day, week after week, month after month. And one day, Steve McQueen bowed his head and asked Jesus into his heart as his Savior. Three months later, three months after his salvation, Steve McQueen was diagnosed with cancer. He asked that Billy Graham could come and visit him. And Billy Graham said this, and I quote. He said that about three months before he knew he was ill, he had accepted Christ as his Savior and started reading his Bible and praying. He said that he had undergone a total transformation of his thinking and his life. A total transformation. Now, isn't that exactly what God wants for you and for me? What is the greatest sign of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Is it being able to go out and speak in a new language? Is it being able to pick up a snake? Is it being able to drink poison? Is it being able to cast out a demon? The greatest sign is that God takes a sinner. And the Bible says all of us are sinners. And the Bible says in Ephesians 2, 1 through 5, that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. But then that sinner, like Steve McQueen, an adulterer, a wife beater, an alcoholic, a drug addict, hears from Sammy Mason, not a preacher, but a flyer, a pilot, about Jesus. And day after day, and week after week, and month after month, consistent witness, and Steve McQueen bows his head and asks Jesus into his heart. At the same time, his wife, Barbara Minty, a fashion model on the, on the cover of Cosmopolitan magazine, realizes that she's a sinner, and she accepts Christ as her Savior. And Minty McQueen said this, being born again in Christ was important to Steve and helped him find inner peace that eluded him so long. 
What is the greatest confirming sign? It's when you and I, dead in trespasses and sin, invite Christ into our life, and as 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, we become a new creation in Christ. People look at us and say, what a difference Jesus made in their life. Now listen, this is a discouraging world. And I get discouraged and you get discouraged. But did you know that the gospel of Jesus Christ, as Jesus sent it out to the, through the disciples, very simply, did you know that it's a message of great victory? It is. Read in your Bibles, Acts chapter 1, verse 15. Do you know how many Christians started? 120. 120. Now think of it. There are billions and billions of Christians today in heaven and on earth. It's a message of victory. You and I can go out of here and we can give the greatest message of victory and hope. It went from 120 to Christians all over the world today. Plainly. I'd like to ask you if you're ready to meet Jesus. Because the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 1 that this Jesus that the disciples saw ascend to heaven, this Jesus that sat at the right hand of God, this Jesus who sat at the right hand of God and was confirmed by Stephen who saw it, this same Jesus is coming again. Here's what the Bible says in Acts chapter 1. They were looking diligently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood before them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go. He's coming back, and I'm asking you if you're ready. So I'll close today with two questions. Question number one is this. Are you ready to meet Jesus? Do you know where you'll spend your eternal days? I want to tell you that church can complicate the message of the gospel. It's really quite simple. Those who believe are saved. Those who don't believe are condemned. Are you sure? Are you sure you're going to spend your eternal days in heaven? If not, I would encourage you to come and to take my hand and say, Pastor, I would like to make sure that I'm a Christian. But then, how will you live your earthly days? I beseech you, I beg you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Do you know what God wants you to do? If you were to take that FOI card, fill it out, put it in the offering plate, say, Pastor, I don't have a clue what I'm supposed to do. I'd help you. And I can promise you in six months, we would know exactly, exactly, exactly what God wants for you to do. Wouldn't you like to walk out of here today a laborer together with God, a worker with God? What a privilege we have. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus, and thank you so much for Sammy Mason. Thank you, Father, that a pilot heard that a man by the name of Steve McQueen, a drug addict, an alcoholic, an adulterer, a wife beater, needed a pilot. Thank you for connecting them. And thank you for, through the faithful witness, not of a preacher, not of a pastor, not of an evangelist, but just a believer in Jesus Christ, that Steve McQueen and his wife, Barbara Minty, became believers in Christ and began attending a local church. Thank you, God, for that. What a message of victory. What a message of hope. Now, Father, today there's probably somebody here who isn't sure that they're a Christian. I pray, God, if that's the case, that you would draw them to yourself this morning. And, Father, for those of us who are Christians, you've said that we are laborers together with you. We work with you. What a great privilege to work with you. Now, Father, we might need to fill out that FOI card and say, Pastor, I don't know how God wants me to work with you. Wouldn't it be great, Lord, if today we chose to discover how you want to work through us? What a difference that would make in our lives. And finally, Father, this morning, I would hope that all of us today would see Jesus not as the baby in the manger, 
not as the Christ on the cross, but as the Lord sitting at the right hand of the Father. And Father, that today, I, all of us, this church collectively, would humbly submit to His authority. Lord, we would change this world if we did that. Thank you for Jesus. It's in His name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and let's sing. I've decided to follow Jesus.